One of the age-old kind of rules of thumb of record collecting, of serious record collecting, if you consider yourself a serious collector or maybe even an audiophile, you're going to want to tune in today to this episode. I want to talk about the theory or the practice of seeking out records from the country of origin and then in turn looking for early pressings of those titles. I have four fantastic examples I'm going to share with you and then a fifth that actually doesn't really fit that equation. Uh, quite famously it, it is uh, something that um, is an anomaly and, and we'll talk about that. So that is today I want to cover country of origin and early pressings of those titles. The theory is here, you know, with country of origin, uh, you want to find a band, let's say they're from uh, the UK and they recorded their album in the UK. Typically that album would have been mastered in the UK as well, and then it would have been uh, plated and pressed in the UK as well. If that all lines up, you want to then go seek out early first pressings from that title because the theory is those are going to be fresh or hot stampers, <laughs> as people are, are known to call those. And they are early presses that have come off of those fresh stampers. So theoretically, they're going to sound bright. They're going to be cut hot, hopefully, they're going to have a full sound stage, they're going to be incredibly detailed. Those are the holy grail as far as record collecting is concerned. Those are what we want. And I want to talk about that kind of theory today. By the way, this is Tim with the University of Vinyl. Thanks for tuning in again today. Um, today's episode, I think it's going to be enjoyable. Thank you as always for tuning in and let's get started. Hey, we may as well start off with a bang and talk about the 1971 epic album from the band Yes. That album is, of course, Fragile. It was uh, released in 1971 on the Atlantic label in the UK and the United States, there is a look at a great recent um, copy that I have recently found out in the wild. Um, here's the deal. I walked into one of those indoor flea markets and started examining this cover and package, saw that it had this interior booklet, still affixed quite nicely. Um, the outer sleeve is in incredible condition. And then I kind of started to take another look at things. I looked at the spine and I don't know if you're going to pick that up, but it says deluxe. Whenever I see deluxe, I know that it's kind of a clue as to it could be a UK pressing. Um, I then kind of looked for some other telltale signs as far as um, the credits. And sure enough, I found that this sleeve uh, was printed and produced by McNeil in London. Let's see if I can get this thing to cooperate. Anyway, there, there are the very important credits. Um... Without even looking at the record, I knew that I likely had uncovered uh, a UK pressing. I then proceeded to kind of look into the sleeve, and lo and behold, I have the grail copy of the Red Plum Atlantic early pressing of Fragile. Um, with the original inner showing those credits about the plastic bag can be harmful to children, etc., etc. Gorgeous, gorgeous album. 
Don't know how it ended up uh, in this collection, in this flea market. Um, but the person who was selling the record didn't do a ton of research because it wasn't even noted as a UK pressing. And uh, it was priced at $20. Obviously, I snapped this thing up. Look at the sheen on this thing. Uh, I mean, seriously, conservatively, this is near mint. There is not a scratch. There is not a mark anywhere on this. And I put this on my turntable, turned up the system a bit, and was absolutely amazed. Shock and awe. <laughs> um, the, the nuance and the clarity of Chris Squire's bass lines, absolutely amazing. Excellent vocals as well. A very kind of full, even presence as far as the soundstage was concerned. Um, natural sounding drums. I was really pleased with this. And I know recently Patrick from the Vinyl Archivist, great channel. Uh, I'm going to leave a link to his channel because I need to credit him a little bit further on in this video for another title. <laughs> anyway, um... Yeah, he recently did kind of a blind test. He's been doing these uh, lately. And he uh, he compared the MoFi One Step, uh, the UK Plum, I think a first American Atlantic pressing, maybe another pressing, and asked for people to um, to vote. And he, uh, he has a, a video about this out there on YouTube. And then he also kind of um, took some votes during a, one of his regular live streams that he does during the week. And um, the UK Plum won out over uh, the MoFi quite convincingly. Um, so I have no desire or intent to seek out uh, this MoFi One Step of Fragile, um, especially now what we know about those One Steps. Um, really, really pleased to find this for $20, um, an original uh, UK um, this is uh, the Matrix as well, uh, matchup. Uh, hold on, where are we here? Yeah, it's an A1, B1, uh, the end of the Matrix. So, um, incredibly pleased. And this definitely is a fine example of country of origin and then seeking out an early pressing. This was uh, recorded in London. Uh, at an old studio called Ad Vision, and then it was trucked across town, um, mastered and cut, uh, plated uh, at a plating facility called Phono Disc. Uh, I believe that place is now defunct as well in London, and then presumably pressed somewhere in the U in the UK. Uh, if you can find. Uh, Anywhere, you know, if you're at a record show, maybe you're looking on Discogs, you want to get an early pressing of this Red Plum Atlantic Fragile. It's an incredible pressing. So happy to uh, add this to my collection. Next up, I've got a kind of a post-punk new wave album. One of my favorite periods uh, in, in recording history or in music history. This band first kind of came into my orbit with the albums New Gold Dream and then Sparkle in the Rain. I'm talking about Simple Minds. I literally just found this a few days ago at a brand new record shop um, in Fort Collins, Colorado called Songbird Records. Um, I'm gonna drop a link to uh, to his uh, his website or his Instagram. I'll, I'll figure out which one to do, but Really nice new addition to the burgeoning vinyl scene uh, here in the Fort Collins area. This record's fantastic because it kind of showed the way that, that Simple Minds were on their way to going, you know, into uh, New Gold Dream and uh, Sparkle in the Rain and then the more commercial titles as, as we got further into their trajectory. You know, Don't You Forget About Me, the huge single, um, etc., etc., one of the things that really strikes me when I hear this album um, is the incredible tone and playing of guitarist Charlie Burchill, uh, the main guitarist for the group. He was on a par, I think, literally, from that era, um, 
with Paul Reynolds from Flock of Seagulls and, of course, The Edge. They all kind of shared similar ideas and tones um, in their playing, and they're all very, very distinctive. Uh, Charlie Burchill is no slouch. This is a great, great kind of post-punk, new wave-ish album, moving a little more into synths, uh, but plenty of guitar, plenty of great drumming on this uh, album as well, great bass playing. Jim Kerr, uh, an evocative, uh, emotional singer, um, really kind of moving into their own as a band. Um, you can definitely see where they were headed if you find this album. Uh, this is an early uh, standalone UK pressing. It was originally packaged with another album that's escaping me now, um, but this is the standalone copy uh, mastered by Dennis Blackham, otherwise known as Bilbo. Um, so look for Bilbo in the Dead Wax. And uh, this was on the Virgin label. Uh, they actually kind of gave Simple Minds at that point in time, earlier in their career, kind of a custom label, which looks very cool. Matching uh, the kind of the color scheme um, of, the, of the artwork uh, on the cover. Great album by Simple Minds, Sons and Fascination, 1981. This is an early UK pressing. It definitely applies to the country of origin uh, situation that we're talking about. When we talk about that early run of 1970s classics from Elton John, most people know that the UK pressings are the ones to seek out. The 1975 album, the first of two that would be released that year, was of course Captain Fantastic and the Brown Dirt Cowboy. This is an amazing album, one of the best sounding records in my collection as far as early first presses are concerned. Um, I think it blows audiophile um, pressings out of the water, or it would if you, do, if you would do a straight up um, A-B test. Uh, here is a look at that uh, label with DJM there. These are head and shoulders above any run-of-the-mill United States uh, pressings that you may find. It is worth your while to seek out these DJM UK pressings on all of those um, Elton John titles in the 1970s. Absolutely amazing album. Um, I, this, this copy, this pressing blew me away so much that I, uh, I have a separate video um, doing one of these newfangled reaction. Uh, it's a newfangled reaction video. You can, you can too, uh, watch me uh, do some needle drops to this album and listen intently with me as I react. If that's your bag, um, I'm going to drop a link to that video as well in the uh, in the description to this video. But this is an absolute must. It definitely proves the theory of country of origin and early pressings uh, recorded in the United Kingdom. Elton, of course, is from the UK. And uh, a fantastic pressing uh, on the DJM label. I mentioned Patrick, uh, the Vinyl Archivist channel, earlier because... Uh, he does these regular um, live stream auctions that are really cool. If you haven't tuned in, I highly recommend uh, keep an eye on Patrick's channel. And he, he's been doing them every two or three weeks, maybe once a month. Um, I've participated in several. Uh, it's a very fun, low-key thing. You can just basically type in a bid. Um, they do a 30-second timer. And if you're lucky, you might win a title or two. But, but Patrick has... Um, a lot of records that kind of move in and out of his collection because he rips a lot of these um, for for kind of you know history's sake and uh, doesn't really need um, you know the record in his collection in the future. So he offloads things in these auctions. Um, this is an early first pressing of one of my grails, one of my favorite albums in the world. Abbey Road, uh, The Beatles, 1969. Let's take this out of the plastic because it's a, kind of a cool, you know, the UK did these great laminated covers and you can kind of see the sheen and the luster on this, um, on this cover. Um, couple things to point out here quickly. 
you'll notice that the zebra crossing here, the last portion here, is just a little bit uh, visible. And the space between the building and the trees up here is minimal. So that tells me, along with this big clue on the back, if you look at the Apple logo, it's misaligned. Um, that is kind of a telltale sign that you have an early pressing. Now, other uh, also, there's no mention of Her Majesty's request, which would appear later uh, on the actual uh, label. Love the fact that I've got this kind of misaligned label. Um, I won this auction, managed to snap this thing up at a very reasonable price, well below uh, median discogs. Uh, level as, as we stand today. There's a look at that nice deep uh, Apple logo and most importantly in the dead wax, in the matrix, I've got uh, side A is dash 2, side B is dash 1. Those are the telltale signs that you have an early first pressing and this thing is conservatively graded, I would say, at VG+. Plus. There are some faint surface marks, a um, couple handling marks, uh, nothing affects play. This is the most dynamic, um, present sound stages. Uh, the recording is just amazing. This is, um, this is the way you want to hear Abbey Road. You want to find an early um, press uh, from the UK. It's just amazing. I'm so happy uh, to have this. I'm, I'm, I'm happy that Patrick does these auctions. Um, they're a lot of fun and, and I'm gonna definitely, you know, they're highly recommended. I've already talked about it. Um, these auctions are, are a lot of fun and they're highly recommended. Um, so thanks Patrick for putting this up for auction. Um, he told me um, he, on the stream that this was his play copy for years. And um, I don't know, he, he must have found something even cleaner. But um, what a fantastic example. I mean, just as an example on Come Together, the level of clarity here is just incredible. Um, and the separation of instruments. You hear the, um, the toms and the kick drum of Ringo like you've never heard before. Um, like, uh, you know, also, um, Maxwell's Silver Hammer is another thing that comes to mind. The, uh, the cymbal hits on that song are, are just great. Uh, you know, crystal clear with a little bit of decay happening after the hit. Um, I have that, um, what is it? The 2019, um, 50th anniversary, uh, <laughs> This this is the this is the way to go, folks. You want to find an early UK pressing, and um, you can find uh, you can find that same that same cut that same mastering. Uh, you know, researching Abbey Road is a labyrinth labyrinth, and um, you can definitely go down a rabbit hole. But um, they were still using um, that cut into the early '70s, so you can do some research and and, and find something but I love the fact that this is an early 1969 pressing um, that kind of is signified by that misaligned cover um, as well as the uh, um, you know the, the proper matrix in the dead wax um, I'm I'm thinking this was an early early run off of an early stamper and uh, incredibly happy about it Okay, last but not certainly not least, we have something that actually doesn't really fit into the equation where country of origin and then having uh, you would have you would have thought that it would have been uh, mastered and and cut uh, and pressed in the same country. That is definitely not the case um, with who's next. So. Famously, Who's Next was released in the United States first. Um, usually it's the other way around. So Who's Next was released in early August 1971, and it was then released in the UK two weeks later. I think it was released on August 7th, 71 in the US, 
and then the um, 21st or the 27th in the UK. Don't quote me on that, but I, I know that the UK came after two or three weeks later. What happened is this was recorded at a couple different studios in, uh, in London, including uh, Olympia, and Pete Townsend was aware of Doug Sachs and the Mastering Lab. Someone flew the master tapes to Doug Sachs in Los Angeles, and he did the initial cut from the master tapes. Doug Sachs has a very kind of unique etching uh, or writing style. When he etches the, uh, the number eight, they're actually tilted to the right. I'm gonna show a close up of the dead wax. And um, also, I wanna let you know that I did a prior video called The Quest, and I compared um, an early track record cut, which also used uh, at least one side of the Doug Sachs West Coast cut. Um, and then I think um, I had Dennis Blackham on side two. Um, but anyway, that, that video was called The Quest, and it was kind of a shootout amongst three different copies or pressings. Check it out if you're a Who's Next fan. Anyway, I have a W1W1 matrix copy with Doug, Doug Sachs's telltale kind of etching in the dead wax. And this is the best version of this album I have ever heard. Um, it is incredibly lively, incredibly detailed. Uh, the bass from John Entwistle is fully present, fully there, punchy, full sounding, exactly what you want to hear from John Entwistle playing, playing bass. Um, Townsend's guitar cuts through. Uh, Keith Moon has very natural sounding drum hits. Uh, it's just, it's an amazing album. It's an amazing capture. Um, you want to find an early pressing of this album, uh, U.S. Decca. Look for that Doug Sachs etching, um, the Telltale etching in the Dead Wax. Um, I'm, put, I'm putting up the actual um, Dead Wax information right now as I speak. Um, what else can I say about this? What happened is that um, they used that initial Doug Sachs cut at the Mastering Lab in Los Angeles. Um, they took those lacquers and uh, early versions of the track records also used a Doug Sachs cut. But later on, I think they used dub copies of those master tapes and things started to degrade down from there as far as sound quality and, and, uh, and clarity uh, in that mix. Um, so, I will let you know that these things are still out there. I found this literally a month and a half ago in a bin for $7 um, in our used record shop. Uh, this, should, this should have been priced at $30 or $40 in my opinion. Absolutely snapped it up. I, the first thing that kind of caught my eye was the condition of the cover. Usually you have a ton of ring wear here. Um, but this thing was in great shape. Anyway, that is something that doesn't really apply. The Who are from England. Uh, the album was recorded in England, but the master tapes were flown all the way to California, mastered there, and released first in the United States. That's why you want to seek out the early DECA uh, pressings from Doug Sachs. Hey, everybody. That was today's video, taking uh, a look at the country of origin theory coupled with early pressings, uh, hopefully from the same country. If that all happens, um, you're, you're going to be in luck. And you, if you find early pressings, uh, hopefully you'll find a fantastic sounding record. Thank you again for watching. I uh, will be back very soon, early this week, with something else and something interesting. Um, hopefully you'll tune in. Thanks as always.